It's an interesting time in India's history. The country has a woman president, a woman finance minister, and a woman running SEBI. The women in India are over the moon. They have played a crucial role in the lunar mission, in the solar mission. In my interaction with the Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago, he talked about how to take India to the next trillion that he wants to take the Indian economy. It is going to take Nari Shakti. We cannot do it without that. According to the West Global Gender Gap Report, it will take at least 131 years to close that gap. So to solve problems like this one, easy, I'm joined today by a super hot panel in our very cold studio in Davos. Dipali Goenka is the CEO of and CEO and MD of Wellspan, a global leader in home solutions, and her vision is Har Ghar Me Wellspan. A little bit like Har Ghar Me Nal, but okay. <laughs> Priya Agarwal Heber is the chairperson of Hindustan Zinc, India's largest and world's second largest producer of zinc. And Devjani Ghosh is the first woman president of NASCO, an apex body of the technology industry of India. Welcome. Since we are just two weeks into the new year, and we're still in January, New Year's resolutions are still hot. Devjani, you had a great one. We had <laughs> Dave, Daniel Craig grooving to get up and drive that funky soul in 2024, and that's the vibe. Would you care to elaborate, please? <laughs> Daniel Craig is a vibe. <laughs> He's definitely a vibe. Everyone in this panel is suddenly feeling hotter. <laughs> He's a vibe. But, you know, I, I did that because um, I was, just before I posted that, I was reading quite a few of the predictions, uh, the usual 2024 predictions. And everyone sort of, they're so optimistic about how 2024 will solve every single problem out there. You know, everything that went wrong in 2023 will be right in 2024. So, I was sort of thinking about that. I don't know, this has to be magic. And the only, whenever I think magic, it's that's the name that <laughs> comes to mind. So I sort of posted that, saying this is the vibe of 2024, where we believe that everything um, that went wrong earlier or that didn't work earlier is going to work. So all fingers crossed. Let's see what happens. So you are feeling very optimistic about 2024. Um, mixed. Mixed. Daniel is there to pep you up any time, <laughs> any time you start planning. I think there's a lot of work, at least for technology. There's just tremendous amount of work left uh, to be done. Okay. Priya, you talk about the seeds that you have sown, and some of those will come to fruition in 2024. Talk to us a little bit about what are those seeds that you've sown, and what are you kind of expecting and excited about in 2024? Um, so, you know, being a woman in a male-dominated sector, uh, you know, very hardcore mining and natural resources <laughs> sector, when I entered uh, the boardroom for the first time, very young, uh, young girl, anxious, nervous, um, you know, with, you know, um, eight, ten male head honchos around me, extremely experienced, um, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and, and, you know, the first thing I felt was, you know, this needs to change. There needs to be, uh, you know, there needs to be inclusivity at all different kinds of levels. You know, like, uh, unless we have that, we're not going to see progress. Mm -hmm. And and from that day, really, it was a mission. And today, we're close to having 30% women in our in our leadership. And not only that, um, we're talking about women. In 2019, um, women were legalized to go underground and mine. Hindustan Zinc was the first company in India to get women underground. Yeah. And these are women who are driving forklifts the first woman rescue team of India and we have an entire mine which is run primarily by women now. It's, it's so amazing because you go to them, you speak to them and you know what they say the first thing uh, a few days ago when I went and met them, they said, Priya, the, I feel safer when I'm one kilometer under the ground. It's, it's, it's just, it gives me goosebumps, it's, it's an amazing feeling and that's, that's progress, you know, that, that's where we have to head. So we're going to come back, back to that. Women Absolutely. on top of the world by being underground. Absolutely. We're going to come back to that. Tipali, let's talk about yours. You made yours public so that others can motivate you to stay committed. Can you talk a little bit about those? So for me, um, I think um, I started working when I was 30 uh, and my girls were like 7 and 10. Um, for me, again, it was a male-dominated um, textiles uh, you know and uh, for me to come in come on board was a big deal people felt that I was people were like is well been serious about what they're doing 
Um, and I think the interesting thing here was that people didn't realize that the other side is a woman. Mm. The decision maker is a woman. And I think what a woman can do and make a difference, nobody else can. And uh, for me, I played on my strengths here, Kali. And I think for me, that was the game changer. Uh, because today, um, I'm talking about har ghar se har dil tak well spun. But I think present in 50 countries across the globe and um, a vendor and a partner of choice to all the global retailers and a choice for a product for home in India. I think the important thing is thinking consumer thinking the way she's going to buy, the buying habit, habits that she has, is really made a lot of difference. But one more thing just I want to add on, 30% um, women, as Priya said, was a big task for me because to influence um, uh, the family uh, to get the women and share the workload was a big deal. But today, happy to say that, you know, um, not only blue-collar associates um, are there, but white-collar as well, around 12%. Um, and it's, it's, it's a long way for us to go, but, uh, yeah, the journey's begun. So one of the things, I'm going to come back to the 30%, but one of the things that you said in your New Year's post, and that really resonated with me and I'm sure with other women, is you talk about wanting to spend more time with the family, more time with your daughters, having more time to read, which kind of alludes to balance right? Having that elusive balance in life. Now, what is your secret sauce? How do you do it? Um, I think by creating more leaders. And, um, and it's not easy to say that. I think it's about sharing your vision. Um, and I think the other person being more motivated and running with that vision of yours, which is, you know, is a very important part of what you do. Um, and I think uh, saying empowering is less done, but I think leading it uh, in the way of, by an example, where everybody holds that vision and is excited to be part of that vision is a big deal from the blue collar to the white collar and to my global teams across. I think that's what it is. And I think that's the purpose. And if you've done that, um, I think half your work is done. Can I just add to that? Yeah. Um, I, I think balance is impossible. Mm. I absolutely believe balance Realist. is impossible. Okay? <laughs> it's more about integrating both lives with each other or into okay. each other, right? Nice. And something a mentor of mine taught me, and it's a beautiful thing, and I use it. I use this every day, literally, maybe multiple times every day. She said, you have two balls. One is rubber, one is crystal. When you drop the rubber ball, it'll bounce back. When you drop the crystal ball, it'll shatter. Every day, based on priorities, you have to decide which is which. And no regrets. No that apologies, no regrets. When you decide family is the crystal ball, you will communicate that to everyone you need to communicate, and you will ensure you do not drop that ball. And when you decide work is crystal, you'll do the same. And I, I have used that mantra uh, literally every day of my life. Because I think balance is impossible. It's about figuring out your priorities. And it's about communication, as you just said, mm -hmm. so that people understand the other side. OK. Priya, you are a younger generation. You are a younger mother. And we were just discussing in the room outside that maybe things have changed a little bit, right? And mothers or women are not feeling guilt, because that's one of the things that comes with um, ambition, right? Oh, she's ambitious. Now I so feel guilty about that. Yeah. So. Talk us a little bit about that. So, you know, a few different things here. For me, number one, actually, I changed when my daughter was born. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when she was born, I looked at her and I said, she needs to see a, a mother uh, who inspires her. And she needs to see a mother and, and a woman uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a man uh, who's her father who's supporting that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, she, wants, she needs to see a woman in front of her who she can be or be better than. So it's, it's up to us, first and foremost, to ensure that we are their role models. And I'm telling you, the day she was born, I changed. Completely. Beautiful. So, Dipali, you said this as well, because yeah. you came back, you married early at yeah. 18, uh, came from a traditional background, and then after your daughter's at 30, you went back to work, which is an unusual decision. I want you to talk us a little bit about that, talk us through that a little bit, because there are a lot of women who start families and then they get out of the yeah. workforce and they don't yeah. have the confidence to yeah. come back. Yeah. So what did it take? How did you fight your inner demons to do that? Um, it was just not the, just the inner demons, but also kind of, uh, you know, very interestingly, uh, coming from a Marwari community, very, very traditional. I have two daughters. Mm. Um, the big question was that you don't have a son. <laughs> and um, 
um, you know, who's going to take this forward? For me, that was a very important aspect. The outer demons. The outer <laughs> demons, yeah. And leading it from there, actually, you know. And uh, I wanted to set an example and open the door for my yeah. girls. And that's where it began from, Kali. For me, it was there that they need to see a mother who can do it from a homemaker to, uh, you know, becoming an entrepreneur. And do they see it? They see it, my younger daughters leading a brand, Christie, in uh, UK and uh, taking that forward. Um, and I, I think that really makes a difference. Uh, and plus, I think uh, for women who work in my offices and my factories, they feel safe as well. Yeah. Uh, the communities that you work with, um, I think women um, have that softer side that really uh, makes a lot of difference as well. Um, so I think it truly is, and we always say at Wellspun, leading tomorrow together, it's truly that. For us as well. So Dave Johnny, from what I've heard, you didn't have that much of a traditional background because you were the first uh, CEO, woman CEO of Intel. Um, so you've been supported by your family to have a career and to have ambitions. So how important do you see that role of the family? Not to have those outer demons, but to have outer angels, so to say. <laughs> uh, couldn't have done anything without it. Absolutely. I mean, that is so important. I mean, I grew up in a very, very large um, joint family, you know, with lots of boys. Um, and I was the youngest, and I was a girl. And my dad from day one was, um, whatever these guys do, you're going to do it better. Wow. Right? I mean, that was, that was pretty much. And, um, you know, I think it's amazing, and this is what a lot of, I, I always tell young parents to do this. Uh, when you have those ambitions for your child, you have to first communicate it. They have mm. to know. No one reads your mind, right? They have to know that you believe in them. You believe in their ability to do something big. Uh, because of all the boys in the family, there used to be a lot of talk about sports. And I remember space because that was a fascination and politics. And dad would always ensure when he's talking about it, he would give women examples. Right. One of the things my parents got very scared because because I was to hear in that time one of the politicians was Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. So I started looking up to her. You know, and, uh, <laughs> we thought we were to have a prime minister in the family. <laughs> that scared dad a bit. <laughs> so Priya, you married um, for love. Absolutely. And um, how important is the role your husband has played in your growth and in making the decisions? Because you also grew up with a very traditional backdrop, yeah. right? You were not allowed to go out, etc. And there you made a jump now, yeah. and you're heading up um, the Hindustan Zinc Company. It, it, so. it was a big deal when I broke it to my father that you know I've uh, I've been you know I want to marry someone who I've who I've known for quite some time, and he's 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 not from the community we're in, nor is he from a business family. Uh, you know, I I think he's he he broke down first, but then um, you know <laughs> when 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 they met. Everything changed, and and, and and that's because, and, and I think that's that's what's important today. I think in in, in, in urban India at least, um, the support that men give to uh, you know to family to their children today. When I'm traveling or when I'm out for work, he's very much 100% their hands-on father. You know, he's there, he's guiding her, he's teaching her. But you know, the, the problem comes when we're talking about the mass, the masses. When we're talking about India as, as a country and as a whole, and we're talking about the care economy overall. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, women and, 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 the, and the privileges that the three of us have got in terms of, um, you know, education and, and, and support from our families. A lot of them do not have. Yeah. And, and it's, it's up to us now to inspire, to motivate um, in, in whatever area we can, how we can collaborate with the government in their schemes and, in, 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 you know, in initiatives that they're taking such that we can really, uh, you know, at least in our uh, in our organisations, motivate and, and inspire these women to come on board. I was I was I was saying a story, um, you know, yesterday, that uh, you know last year I met what our head of security at Hindustan Zinc um, is a woman, and she's part of the LGBTQ uh, community, and she told me last year that Priya, I have two dreams. Uh, I want to buy my mother a house, and I want to adopt a baby girl. And just a few weeks ago, she called me and she said, Priya, I've done both. Wow. And this is you know this is India. This is this today. Is this is this is in a yeah. small town in Rajasthan where ladies are seen to be much even more backward than the rest of the country. This this lady has has done what she believed and what she truly wanted to do. So, 
if you dream if you want to do something there's nothing that can stop you from doing it it's it's on it's it's up to us to ensure we inspire and we enable as much as we so can so let's talk about that a little bit right because all three of you come from industries which are pretty male dominated right uh, you are coming from the manufacturing of uh, like a factory blue collar space mm -hmm. you're coming in from mines you're coming in from tech which is known for not having enough women right what are the things that you think we can do or other people can do as well to increase participation can we do a rapid fire on that mm -hmm. okay so i'll just go around like a okay. round robin okay crashes or child care at work oh, absolutely absolutely 100% yes more of it menstrual leave i think flexible leave for to both genders when you need it and you decide because as sometimes we overdo also it's not that menstrual leave is not important but make it flexible we have a no questions asked policy that we've just released um it means you can take a day off the month no questions no questions asked it's not about menstrual it's about general like she was saying flexible working hours you know uh, seeing what the 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 examples that she was giving about prioritizing flexibility but not just this is not equality but i think flexibility uh, for the genders and uh, i think gender is agnostic i think this is very very important okay supportive partners and how do you do that a little bit you know with um a, a class maybe which is not as educated where maybe the the family is not being as supportive what can you do about that or what have you done You know, Sandberg, Cheryl Sandberg said this so beautifully that if you have ambitions, then marrying who you choose to marry is the most important career decision you make. <laughs> um, I think it's so important to educate women, and whenever I'm talking to young women, especially in schools, colleges, that's the one thing I talk about. You cannot keep your ambitions closed. You cannot keep it hidden. It cannot come as a surprise. You have to tell your partner or to be partner, and um, if he reacts. in a way that you were surprised and maybe you need to look for another i think it's yeah i mean exactly what she said in terms of education but for men and women and um you know especially in the, in the masses in the rural areas where the the how, the the the, uh, the mother in laws are very important you yeah. know we've seen a lot of the decision making is done by the mother in law and the father in law so you know when you have self help groups and you you know we have a self help group in you know there put they make it a point that they go into houses across their communities to make sure they're educating the entire family as to how the man and the woman can be equal uh, you know yeah. whereas uh, whereas it works so i think it's 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 um, you know exposing them to what they can do and then making sure they themselves are going and educating individuals who are within their community that's the only way we're going to spread the message the pali I always say give them wings they'll fly and I think the important thing here is that you know um we did a program with uh, you know an NGO called Swasti where we just didn't you know we help, we actually trained the men to share the workload and the family to share the workload and that way we got more women at the workforce I think that was very very important and I think um I always believe that if you empower a woman you're empowering not just not the uh, not herself but the communities and the children as well I mean a growth of 5 trillion GDP that India is dreaming of and if the communities and women are empowered I think that's the way we'll see a difference happen So you talk a lot about EQ and why that's important. Now, talk us a little bit about the emotional emotional quotient and you know how does that play out at the workplace. So uh, you know what I think. Uh, let me play. Uh, let me speak about the EQ in the terms of business. Okay. I think uh, for uh, for I, I'll tell you about textiles, and mm -hmm. I think you know for me we we run a brain trust globally, where you know we we find out what the consumer is looking at, mm -hmm. and uh, to see that you know what is she uh, you know wanting to buy is an ability. So I think they've journey to even tech or you know AI, yes. the ability to predict and forecast what she's going to buy after three months, or whether you know in Midwest in America or in Madhya Pradesh or in you know in down south, what is she planning to buy? I think the ability to see that. is a very important thing it's not not just selling a towel or a sheet for me mm. or just the production that lot of people look at so in manufacturing so that intuitive feel you think is better with women yes absolutely absolutely and the experience experience i mean you can ramp up that consumer experience like how anywhere you talked about it that you walk into the office now because you've got a 30% increase in in the women leadership and you feel this female absolutely. energy and it makes you happy what is that female energy it's it's i mean you know i think it's just about you know And and what and it's it's about seeing that we're actually going towards that direction. You know, it's going to take some time yeah. where we stop talking about women empowerment, 
we start talking about women led development we start talking about inclusivity in fact we we lose the word women all together yes. uh, you know we're talking about just leaders we're talking about you're here because you're capable you're here mm. because you want to be here you're here because you're passionate to be here that that's really where we want to head of course now because we're 127 years behind according to the <laughs> world economic forum there's a bit of push we need to do but you know we're all heading towards that direction as to you know you're, yeah. you're, 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 you want to be here so you're here it doesn't matter your woman man Amen. lgbtq <laughs> wherever whoever you are doesn't matter give jani you talk about that that women are important for this new yeah. tech decade yeah. right now why what is so important to have women in the technology space for all of us so just taking a step back yeah. if you know if you so if you're going to any conversation in davos the one thing you will hear about is supply chain resilience mm -hmm. right everyone's talking yeah. about supply chain resilience yeah. and why it's so critical for business continuity and growth one of the things that's badly broken in in the supply chain um value chain is uh, talent your talent supply chain is one of the biggest challenges today that ceos are facing yeah. because of especially in tech mm. because of global shortage and every business today is tech every business today yeah. is digital hers is hers is yeah. right so everybody is facing that challenge i believe that um women are the answer to bridging that gap to a very large extent and today the most important tech skill is not learning about ai you can't first of all learn about yeah. ai you have to do ai you have to build ai right it's not learning about technologies the most important tech skills are cognitive skills analytical skills creative skills and women i will say so are slightly better placed <laughs> when it comes to these skills they are it's just intuitive it's mm. organic uh that's one reason why in our industry at hiring women are 52% plus mm -hmm. right and then it becomes the average goes to around 36% but this is the reason we need more women desperately because these are the skills we have to build into the workplace so you say the fact that women have the ability to have uh, multitask and have multidisciplinary intelligence helps in they they are women are great at problem solving mm. i think problem solving is very natural to a woman mm. and that's what we need right now women are also good at learning they can throughout their lives they're learning to adapt they're learning new things they're learning new skills so they are much better at learning unlearning and learning and these are the skills the most important skills of today is the ability to learn and the ability to problem solve the I and mean, that's where cognitive and analytic uh, analytics comes in we're going to come into ai but i think the pali you want to jump in you you have something you want to add to this no i totally agree with that and i think um, uh, women tend to be better at it um even i i'll tell you one thing for me it's about the threads and it's about the warp and the weft and the spinning and the weaving and ab about the design thinking as well i think everywhere and uh, and i you know the cognitive skills as you rightly said i think for me for textiles it is far more relevant than anything yeah. else whether you're looking at the trends on the runway to looking at what the consumer experience is going to be or whether you're running the factory and your machines or upskilling them you know for the technology and industry 4.0 i think they are fast learners and i think um, and you know devjani the important thing that you spoke about was skilling when you're talking about this 1.4 billion you know kind of people in india i think and the way we are ramping up for manufacturing it's not going to be technology alone it's going to be manufacturing skilling is going to be a very critical um, yeah. um, a bit so yeah. i think that's going to be a very very important way of looking and growing india as a country yeah. so devjani for you actually you in one person are all the buzzwords of 2024 woman okay ai okay india okay <laughs> 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 I am the buzz man is just waiting okay what's going to come next <laughs> No so I want to get back a little bit to technology and AI right one of the problems that we are hearing about mm. is that in AI the data sets that have been used are not inclusive and so there is a bias against women in those data sets now what is it that we can do to correct that and is it too late already AI is very nascent let's okay. all be very clear about that the race to ai has just about begun the narrative has hyped up tremendously but when you look at deployment of ai at scale it's still work in progress okay. it's it still hasn't happened and i think if 2023 was the 
peak of AI hype. I hope 2024 will be the valley of reality where we finally come back to what the real problem is, where's the promise of AI, what do we have to do to unlock it, right? Now, talking about AI and bias, um, if you ask me to show, you know, how do we get bias out of AI, my question is, how do we get bias out of human beings? Hmm. Every human being has bias, all of us have, right? It's wired, hardwired into us. And we have to stop forgetting that humans have a huge role in shaping AI. AI is not shaping itself as yet and will not for a very long time to come. There's a very big debate on that, yeah. but this there panel is, is not there is, AI, but so we can look, go back to Look at the data, right? Yeah. Humans are shaping AI today, and humans are shaping the AI narrative. We have to bring back the accountability on humans. It's our job to ensure we shape it right. Yeah, but Microsoft and ChatGPT did say that they did not understand what the inner purpose of uh, ChatGPT was to suggest suicide to a, a reporter and, you know, one of them to divorce his wife. Hallucination so happens. That maybe, you know, it is creating an inner purpose of its own. And I think that was, not... in technical terms, that was pure hallucination. In the early days of models, there was a lot of hallucination. Since then, there's a lot of work that has gone into cleaning up the data. Um, and hallucinations, you won't hear about hallucinations much now. But they are significantly because you come can't, down. beyond a point, now talk to the AI, right? Like after 10 questions, it says, now this chat has to be ended, now please start to Well, that's topic. a great way to stop right? hallucinations, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So, so I'm saying, has so the problem been solved or has it just been solved? No, no, well, it's work in progress. See, as you rightly said, it all goes back to data health. Right? Where you're getting your data from, what quality is it, how are you using it, right? And what, what um, filters are you putting in place? So, uh, and again, that's where the human accountability comes in. Mm -hmm. We have to be very clear where our data is coming from, what it looks like, how good or bad, bad it is, and what filters are we using when we say this is good data. We have to define that. Right? And we have to be transparent about that. Are you I happy that's the with the efforts step. that are being made in the industry? Because you have a bird's eye view of that. Um, I think people are waking up uh, to, the, to the urgency, to the need. People are also waking up to the accountability that if I don't do this, I am accountable and it has tremendous reputational damage, so people are waking up to that. So yes, it's being taken much more seriously. Can more be done? Of course. There seems to be a bit of a paradox, right? Because they all keep talking about responsible AI, we have to make it ethical, it has to do good. But at the same time, they're going on doing more and more with it. So it, it it's just sort it, of it, like, have you fixed the problems? Because you're making it bigger, stronger, more powerful. There is no end goal. And I think you have to realize that with any technology. There is no finishing post or an end goal out there. The moment we take two steps forward, the goalpost has yeah. moved behind, right? So this has to be an ongoing process. We will never get, you know, we will always continue to try to get it right. But the one thing we have to change, and my, my ask to companies is, let's stop talking about making AI safe, because that means you've made AI and now you're figuring now yes. how to make it safe. We have to build the focus back on making safe AI and build the principles around it. I think that's going to be very important. So from what you said, that with technology, you take two steps forward, but there's no end goal, and the goal shifts. And technology is a woman. Technology is definitely okay. a She's woman. She's like completely zapping me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think technology has a gender, and it's woman. OK. <laughs> if you say so, I'll go with it. <laughs> so. I would like to know, right, since so many of us do so many different roles, is technology going to give us a digital twin soon? I think Priyan, Dipali, and me, or maybe you as well, would quite like a digital twin. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. The focus has to be on use cases, right? And this is where we go wrong with technology. We keep getting carried away with all these cool things. To do what? I would love a digital twin from a healthcare perspective. Mm. Yeah. I would love a digital twin, which is being analyzed, so I don't have to spend all my time there, mm. uh, to figure out, uh, you know, not just what is wrong, but what can go wrong. So again, we have to think about how we want to use technology, and we have to start articulating what problem is it going to solve. Uh, we can't just create cool technology for the sake of it. 
what cool technology or di- what would you want your digital twin to do for you? You know, for our, for our industry, safety. Mm. Um, you know, I think that is core to what I would like uh, mm. uh, the digital twin to do because, yeah. you know, for us, uh, our core purpose and, and, and future objective is to get everyone out of the mind. We have to work from, and, and we already have been quite successful in doing a lot of that. The kind of number of people that were, that were um, working in mines now, we've cut it down by maybe 60 to 70 mm-hmm. percent. And now everything that's being operated down there is through the corporate office and, and you can't even imagine. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing and I think... It's a tremendous uh, use case in mining yeah. especially. Yeah. Yeah. Pali? For me, it's about the farmers and uh, I think the, uh, the, f- the thing about the whole, uh, you know, the value chain from farmers to the shelf. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even the kind of quality of uh, the weather, you know, the kind of predictions and the forecast that you have, the quality of soil to the seed to everything is kind of a very key thing and let's not forget that India is an agricultural country yeah. and I think for us in manufacturing, I think the majority is going to be part of that population. So I think for me would be to how AI can help the farmers look at the complete supply chain because I think the key thing for us as well is not just going to be, it's going to be the farmers, it's going to be the manufacturing um, and the ability to forecast not just the crop, the ability to forecast the commodities, the ability to forecast the entire uh, I mean, uh, look at what happened I mean, uh, people forecasting what the fires were in the California to Australia. I think AI could do that very, very well. Um, I think, uh, so there are a lot of dynamic changes that are happening. And I mean, looking at now today, 25 countries will go for ele- elections and it's going to be a 40% change. So I think that all holds a lot of impact on, uh, you know, what we do in businesses as well. So that, that's where I would say. So good, you've help. led me to my huh? uh, wrapping up questions, right, uh, by bringing in elections. Uh, <laughs> all three of you are quite excited about the India story, right? Mm-hmm. In your own ways, you've talked about why this is next decade is going to be about India and in your own industries, which is great, right? Um, what's so exciting about India to you, right? Um, do you think that we're on track to hit the five million, a uh, five Absolutely, trillion yes. <laughs> um, mark? So, I think for me, I can say, I can start off and say that India is in a very sweet spot where all, everybody is looking at, and I mean all the global retailers are looking at the India supply chain and looking at growing businesses here. So I think we are in a great place, the largest democracy, stable at that, and everything is looking good for us. So I think for us, I think it's a great, great opportunity. Ease of doing business, um, and I think the whole ecosystem, not just about the startups, the manufacturing, the tech, I think everything here um, is going to be a very interesting way of looking at what we do. India started as a debt-based economy, and look at where we are today. In, in, in the past 10 years, we've flown up, and, and the next 10 years, we're 100% going to um, get right up there. And I think, you know, just coming back to the topic that we've been, we've been talking about, um, you know, we're already seeing it, like you said in the beginning, but we want more women in decision-making bodies, we want more women in the parliament, we want more women there, uh, you know, because they know, um, you know, what, uh, they, they know what uh, it takes and what we need in terms of, our entire environment more than men do and and if, if we have them there we really have some great and, and leapfrog into uh, the spaces that we want to go so uh, you know there are three key transitions that are shaping the world right now uh, the supply chain transition, the AI transition or digital transition and of course the transition to clean energy mm-hmm. and what amazes me is how uh, fantastically India is poised in all of these three. You cannot have conversations about supply chain resilience without talking about India. You cannot have conversations about global clean energy transition without talking about India. You cannot talk about or have conversations on AI scale and building trustworthy technology without talking about India. So to me, the way India is poised right now, I've said this before also, Uh, we are transitioning to becoming inevitable India. We've become inevitable to the world of business, to the world of technology, and that, as the Bali said, is an amazing sweet spot to be at. So Prime Minister's going to be very happy because he's looking at (laughs) women as a voting bloc. This voting bloc seems to have given him a big (laughs) thumbs up. Absolutely. Yes? Absolutely. So last question before we wrap up, right? Uh, One of the things that all three of you have said Uh, echoed from the green room and also through our conversation. Um, We want to be seen as leaders, not just women leaders. What is it going to take for the other side to see you as leaders and not just say, oh, woman leader? What do we need to do? Um, I think the important thing here is that uh, 
how many allies you know the allies do you have in, in an office or in you know in your workplace i think is going to be a very very important mm. thing um and also um women lot of women like you know we have a program called women of wells fund where i think women supporting women and creating real great uh, you know cheer leaders there is going to be a very important bit the women's club finally um, the women's club i think club. it's going to be a very important aspect to whatever we do um, and of course the respect from the peers um, and not because in it and it should be gender agnostic um and i think we have a lot going on for ourselves and and it's a great opportunity and india i think is the place for us to be in yeah i think we have to break our own men- mental barrier i think it's, yeah. it's it's up to us we need to break apart we need when we are in the workplace we cannot approach individuals as women we need to approach individuals as a professional and that's that's really going to take uh, you know make what we want happen and and 100% i can see it happening Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, gender, gender matters for the first one minute of the conversation. <laughs> that, that's it. Then when the conversation starts and you start talking about it, I know no one's thinking about my gender. So uh, to me, it's, it's at least the people who work with me, the industry that know me, no one will dare say women leader. <laughs> you know, they will not. Um, <laughs> so, so I think the transition's already happening. And even if they do, it'll, it'll, it'll be just that first 60 seconds Yeah, that's it. Thank you to your view. Uh, you. It's just been a really nice conversation. I've taken a, a lot away and I hope our viewers have as well. I'm sure they have. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, logging off from cold studio in Davos. Sunny. Yep. Sunny. Pretty sunny. <laughs> sunny. <laughs> Not sunny because of the panel. I started off with that, right? The hot panel in the cold studio and it's kind of happened. Well, thank you for having me here with absolute veterans i'm still yeah. you know learning from all of you so do so not call out our age it is no, no, no. rude to do that <laughs> i'm totally experienced that i'm looking at our age <laughs>